Good evening. I'm Chris Pareja, and I'm your host this evening for The Right Side, the show where we look at today's issues from an admittedly conservative perspective. This evening, we'll be talking about property rights with my guest, Heather Goss, a property rights advocate from the East Bay. Heather, Hi. welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for coming. Sure. So talk to us a little bit about who you are and why you got so passionate about property rights and advocating for others. Well, I've been living in the Bay Area, you know, most of my life, and I'm a realtor, so, you know, I care about private property rights a lot, and I was seeing, um, seeing and hearing people um, uh, talking about, you know, shrinking urban growth boundaries, rezoning, eminent domain, redevelopment, and, you know, all of those things affect private property rights, and I really wanted to know more about it, and the more I dug in, the more I realized that, you know, property rights in the Bay Area are at stake and uh, they're in danger. Okay, you say they're in danger, but why? Is there some kind of evil plot to take away all of our property rights that's occurring currently? Well, you know, I don't know what the motivation is other than we've uh, lost control at our local level. Our local jurisdictions are supposed mm -hmm. to make decisions with the community about, you know, how we grow, how we live, and how our community um, is supposed to look like. And those decisions are slowly um, being kind of sucked up, for a better word, you know, into uh, regional and state governments. And uh, regional bodies are now making decisions about all nine Bay Area counties and how people are going to live and where they're going to live. Mm -hmm. Our Transportation Authority, uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, in uh, conjunction with a uh, the Association of Bay Area Governments, is um, for the first time going to determine for the next 30 years how and where people are going to live for nine million people without a vote of the public. And, and that to me is really alarming. Well, how can they get away with doing something like that? It sounds like it's a very organized effort. Um, are there mechanisms in place for them to even be allowed to do this kind of a thing? Well, you know, there was a bill that was passed in 2008, and it was passed by Steinberg, and it's called the Sustainable Community Strategy Bill. And, and you know, I know sustainable, you know, the word sustainable is out there, and people think it means one thing, but really it's not about the environment. It's really about control and money. And uh, there's a lot of money at stake um, in determining how and where people are going to live. And uh, there's over $200 billion that's being um, given to, by the federal government as a grant to the Transportation Authority, the Regional Transportation Authority. And that bill um, gives them, uh, it mandates that they make a plan and determine where people are going to live. So um, they are going to make that decision for all of us. And the plan is a cookie cutter solution. It calls for, um, high density, I call it stack and pack housing for lack of a better word, but um, high density stack and pack housing next to mass transit. Right. And the idea is that, you know, somehow that by taking people and putting them into, to, in, from vertical sprawl, which they call um, when people kind of, you know, are able to use their property the way they want to, um, the, the suburbs are an example, and then shrinking them and making um, high density housing, that somehow that is better for the environment. But what people don't understand is that those developers that are going to create those high density housing units are all going to get CEQA waivers. So it's and really- tell us what a CEQA waiver okay, is. Okay, yeah. Um, a CEQA waiver is a California Environmental Quality, it's part of the California Environmental Quality Act, which is basically measuring the GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, <laughs> greenhouse gas, yeah. Um, so the idea is, you know, we need to get out of our cars, okay? Right. And so in order to get out of our cars and reduce the number of greenhouse gases, that the central planners, the regional planners, have decided, decided that we are all going to live in, we should be living in these high density housing units next to mass transit. And it all sounds like a good idea in theory, right. but when you start enforcing where people are going to live and how they're going to live and you don't give them choices and um, and also the developers are getting waivers then you realize it's really not about the environment at all because unless they force people out of their cars there's no way to truly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so and that's coming too and it's all part of this act so it's a very scary scary bill. It is a scary bill and, and if they're actually giving waivers to people who play by their rules that's a scarier thing as well because obviously 
there is something that could be at risk by them putting these things into place if they're giving waivers to excuse people from the rules that we all, the rest of us have to abide by, we should be concerned. So tell us a little bit about some of the visioning sessions and things that are coming up here in the Bay Area. That's something that you're advocating heavily to, for citizens to get involved and to have their opinions heard. Tell us a little bit about the organization that's putting these visioning sessions together. Well, MTC, the Regional Transportation Authority for the Bay Area, in association with ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, <clears throat> is tasked with, through SB 375, they have to have um, public input workshops. You know, they have to inform people about this grand plan. I mean, this is going to transform our entire Bay Area. The law says that all they have to do is one, a minimum of one workshop per county. And that's what they're doing. They're doing the bare bones minimum to inform the public as to what's happening and what this big plan is. And frankly, they're doing a terrible job. I mean, you know, the average citizen has no idea that um, this regional body is visioning over their property what, and what their future use of their property will be and how that's going to impact, um, impact them and their neighborhood. And so um, I've been lecturing on, all over the Bay Area and all over the state about SB 375 and, and um, how that is also linked to AB 32, which is the cap and trade greenhouse gas um, bill as well. And, you know, just beating the drum, trying to let people know, because I, I really think that MTC and ABAG have failed to inform the public properly. This is going to completely change people's lives, and the public should know. We should have had exhaustive um, debates about this. It should have been on TV, radio, and instead, one workshop per county with, with they maxed it out at 100 people, and to me, that's just... Um, not good enough and these visioning sessions are happening now they're going out going on through the the month of january and so what we've done is we've taken the liberty of actually downloading one of their demos uh, mm -hmm. from the website to show people what they can look forward to if they can't make the meetings because they didn't find out or they've already passed and so we're going to go ahead and run that now and then we'll look for some of your comments okay. about uh, how accurate the video is in comparison to the sessions themselves okay Let's take a look. The Bay Area is my home. I want to have a say in what happens here. How can people like you and me make our wishes known? Welcome to You Choose Bay Area, a way to express the choices you would make to shape the future of our region. In the next few months, regional planning agencies will be deciding how we move people around and where we build. These decisions will impact housing and transportation for the next two decades. After you read about some of the issues the Bay Area faces, click on the Priorities tab. Do you care most about conserving open space, or is your top concern less local traffic? Rank these issues that are important to you. Once you've set the priorities, click on the Choices tab. It's time to make two choices, where homes should be built, and how neighborhoods will be designed for more people and more jobs. When you've selected your choices, click on Outcomes. On your right, you can see how your priorities make things better or worse than today. On your left, you can see how your choices would translate into benefit or harm to the environment or your pocketbook. After you see your outcome, you may want to go back and change your priorities and choices. Let us know how you would rate your future before you click on Get Involved. By inputting your zip code, we'll know what city matters to you. If you want to get more involved, please enter your email and register for a You Choose Forum near you. Thanks for taking this first step. You can choose the future and create a better Bay Area. And so looking at that, for people who are in the know and have done a little bit of research about the people sponsoring that, such as the last people they showed in the slides, the Greenbelt Alliance and others, these are people that have known agendas and are helping to put these things together, helping to fund, but also helping or receiving benefit from participation in the program. Is that right? 
Well, they they are uh, strategic partners in this, and you know the developers are going to develop the properties. Um, Greenbelt Alliance is going to um, is happy because a lot of property is going to be conserved. They say they call it conserving uh, property as open space. Well, that's taking somebody's private property and making it unusable, and that's an administrative taking, and they're not going to be compensated for that. And when you rezone someone's property as open space, you that takes it off of the, the um, tax roll as well. So the revenue for that city and county is is down. But um, you know it's interesting when you look at these. It, I call it a video game online because you know when you see these things online and they say you choose, and then the next sentence it says in in the next couple of months the regional planners are going to decide. Right. It tells you right there what's happening. You don't choose anything. This is all being chosen for us. And a lot of our local municipalities don't even know that what the plan is. And the thing is, is that this regional plan, once it's in, adopted in 2013, will become a blueprint for all of our local jurisdictions. And there's $200 billion at stake right. in transportation funds. And if our local jurisdictions do not adopt this plan, they will not get the transportation funds. Right. So there's huge dollars at, at risk. Well, and not only that, they say it's you choose, but then they tell you at the end, they'll make sure that you've chosen the right answer. And you can go back and change your choices, which if I hear too much of that type of talk myself, we'd have to wrap the stage in plastic because my head may explode <laughs> just right there because I don't like being told what to do or being uh, corralled in. Now, we do have some footage also of you being passionate in person at one of these visioning sessions. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go ahead and roll some footage of okay. that and then get your feedback on what was happening and if the sessions were as leading as it seems that the website was. Okay. So we'll go ahead and look at that next. All right, great. Right now we're not dealing with how open space would be conserved. We're saying as a value, is that a high priority for us against other things? And if it comes up as a high, very high priority and a local jurisdiction sees that and says, you know, how are we going to accomplish that? Well, but what are, what are the tools? a local jurisdiction sees it's a high priority, but you're not telling us whose open space it is. If it's government property, yes, it does make That's a huge it difference. Does. Are you kidding me? If it's yeah. my property, it you're not, you don't have the right. I, I'm not saying it's not an important issue. If it's government property, that's different. Right. No, you cannot just say it's a value. Because you, you can't value somebody else's property. You can't tell property. somebody else what they can do with their private property. Okay. And exactly that's the same right. thing. All right. of the state, that includes private property. And that you can't, you cannot ask people to vote on something that violates others' private property. Okay. That right. is the question, ma'am. Yeah. Well, it is. I, you know, with all due respect, I, I think no, there's a. You don't mind violating others' property. I do. The, um, I would. I would. Is not just fine. open space. It's mm -hmm. people's private property. Yeah. You cannot have people do this. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I think that's a good perspective to share with us. No, I'm not talking. All right. Okay. Can we go back and just see where where I'm that? Not okay. To you, I think, as, as Erica mentioned, it's, it's perfectly fine to have different, different in, in perspectives, and we expect that. But let's just try and keep, keep this civil, okay? Thank you. Um, as you can see, a lot of, a lot of uh, varying opinions on this, on this question of conserving open space. Okay, conserve water. How important is that to you? Is that a higher So, in watching you in action, you were obviously heated. What gives you the idea? that they're trying to take away people's private property to make this thing happen. Uh, what would you say if someone said, that sounds like a conspiracy theory? Well, it's not a conspiracy conspiracy theory. It's right in the bill. I mean, they require local jurisdictions to identify what they call PDAs, priority development areas, mm -hmm. within uh, their city. Um, and they want to rezone that to mixed multi-use um, so that it is high density. And, the f and because the bill requires each jurisdiction to adopt this plan and the plan calls for housing low income very low income and moderate income so basically um, you know you have to have so much housing and in order to do that um, you have to 
create this high density housing, which is what it calls for. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you're visioning over somebody's property. That property that they call a PDA area, pri priority development area, could be a, a single uh, family residential neighborhood that's been there for 30 years but it happens to be built next to a transit hub and so that's the perfect place to do this because they want us out of our cars mm -hmm. or it could be an industrial park or somebody's business or you know um, so rezoning is one of the things that they do to get people's property um, so they rezone it as mixed multi-use they rezone it to open space so you can't use it they shrink the urban growth boundaries they it calls for um, policies that like um, you draw an arbitrary line around the city and anything outside of that urban growth boundary, anybody who owns property, you can't build on that. Right. So you can only build within these boundaries. So the only way that it would seem logical that people would agree to this kind of thing, this kind of a thing, would be if they were tricked into it. Which, in talking to you, the visioning sessions actually do contain some manipulative practices, the technical term being the Delphi technique. That's right. Tell us a little bit about the choices, how they're presented, and kind of how the outcomes work out. Well, these are all, I mean, these, these visioning meetings are all uh, predetermined outcomes. They already know what they want to do. They want to create a stack and pack, um, high density housing um, model next to mass transit, uh, because that's where they want, they're, they're transit authority. Right. You know, it's like asking a railroad to, to build something else. They want to build railroads. Right. So they're going to come up with a plan to do that. Um, but these visioning sessions, they, they, they have to give the illusion and the appearance that the um, public is actually giving input. So they make uh, everything vague. They don't, get, they don't have any information about how much any of this is going to cost. They don't tell you uh, what the impact on schools are. So let's say you, uh, for instance, in Orinda, okay, in, a, in Orinda they want to build three to five hundred stack and pack units on either side of the freeway and it's a small bedroom community. It's going to change the voting demographic, it's going to impact the schools, it fire safety, none of that is talked about. And the people that come to these meetings, you know, they think, oh, you know, we want his walkability and we want bicycles and all this stuff. Well, what they don't realize is this plan is going to be the only type of housing. There's no, not going to be any more choice. You won't have cars anymore. They want to legislate us out of our cars. Um, it, it calls for policies that um, increase gas prices, uh, bridge tolls, um, HOT lanes, uh, uh, high occupancy. Uh, Vehicle lanes. Yeah, right. and, and higher parking fees. I mean, it's punitive and it's behavior changing. It's socially engineering our lives. And, and what we want is local control. Each community in the Bay Area is so unique, and we want to preserve that uniqueness by having this regional plan by, by planners that have no idea what each community wants and is just providing, just setting a cookie cutter solution. Right. It's going to destroy the Bay Area. Well, we've just got a few minutes left. I wanted to just ask you quickly about legislation that's passed, or actually a Supreme Court ruling, California Supreme Court ruling over the last few days, where redevelopment agencies are okay, the local redevelopment agencies are, have been okay to go away. How is this whole plan for the Bay Area going to be affected by that? Well, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, I've, I've heard many people say, yay, you know, redevelopment is gone because, you know, it's been abused in so many ways, you know, and I'm not saying redevelopment is good or bad, you know, but at least it was local. Right. <laughs> at least there was some accountability. At least it was, it was the decisions about how a community would grow and the funding of that was done locally. So I'm here to let people know that redevelopment is not gone. Redevelopment has gone at the local level. It's now been now going to be handled at the state level, and the funding for redevelopment it will be at the state level. So local jurisdictions just lost their planning capability for the future of their jurisdictions, and now they've lost the funding. So guess what? Whenever they want to change something now they, and, and get transportation funds, they're going to have to buy into all of this. And the developers are going to buy into it because they're going to get part of the money and waivers and all this other stuff. Are you saying pay for play really <laughs> exists? <laughs> well, you know what? The thing is, is that all of this is done and not one person got to vote on this. I mean, you know, this is just unbelievable to me that nine million, they're projecting nine million people are going to be living in the Bay Area in the year 2040 or 2035. And we are supposed to be now planning on how everybody's going to live and where they're going to live. Regional planners, not us. Right. Our vote doesn't count. 
and all I want is an honest dialogue about this. And so I'm out there telling people what is really going down because they need to be talking to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. They need to be contacting their assembly person, um, their senator in California, and demanding accountability. We should have a vote on this. The American public should have a vote, and the citizens of the Bay Area deserve it. Well, in our final minute, can you just give us an, a little bit of information on where we can find out more about you or your initiatives or the, this Bay Area planning initiative as a whole? Well, um, if you want to know where the workshops are, you can go to uh, planbayarea.org slash workshops. And I uh, highly recommend that people get involved in that. Um, like I said, you know, people need to be contacting their local assembly person. I mean, a lot of their local jurisdictions don't even know about this. You know, ask your city council person. They, they don't sit on these ABAG and MTC boards. They have representatives. And I, I, I know that a lot of them really don't know what's coming down. So um, if they don't know, we don't know. So you need to really get involved. Um, but but um, all the information is on Plan Bay Area. Go to the workshop, speak out, and just say no to SB 375. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Heather, for joining us this thanks evening. You've educated us all. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. And now we'll be taking a quick break, and we'll be bringing our next guest, Howard Myers, in to talk about our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. Welcome back to The Right Side. We'll now be speaking to our guest and underwriter, Howard Myers of the Conservative Forum. Howard, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the Conservative Forum and what the Conservative Forum is all about. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I've been involved with the Conservative Forum uh, for about five years. The Conservative Forum was uh, founded about eight years ago by Richard Gino and Jack Mallory. It's basically uh, a forum that's set up to have a, the mission is to um, promote the uh, uh, values of the American uh, liberty. And in order to do that, they're doing this in an educational way. The, the forum is actually uh, an educational, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And some people think that the uh, nonpartisan and conservative can't go together. But in fact, we are nonpartisan, have been from the very beginning. One of the co-founders uh, was and is a Democrat. And so there really isn't room for the partisanship, but we are very uh, strong on conservative values. So we've been that way for uh, the last eight years, and we continue to grow. And so I think we're doing something right. So grow. So conservatives, Bay Area, I'm thinking you've gone from five people to ten. About how many people <laughs> co participate in the conservative forum? Okay, we closed last year, 2011, with 587 paid members. We've outgrown two venues in the last several years. We, um, yeah, we, you know, it, it just continues to grow. We're doing something right because we continue to, to grow. We have between 175 and or 500 plus members at the various meetings. Or, excuse me, not members, but participants. We average about 250 participants per meeting. So, like I say, we are becoming more and more popular. We had to uh, find new venues because they're just not big enough. So now uh, we're at the uh, 432 uh, Sterling Road in Mountain View. Um, we have uh, a very large facility and we're making very good use of it. And so that's one of the things that I appreciate about the conservative forum. You'd mentioned the nonpartisanship. There are Democrats, there are Republicans, there are conservatives. And I find that even just talking to people in the street, when you talk to them as humans, uh, a lot of times the issues are the same concerns to them. 70 to 90 percent of the time, if we take the political labels off and just say, hey, is education important to you? Is having a safe neighborhood to live in important to you? Is making sure that the government is working for you instead of against you or to put you in prison? Most people agree that these are things that, that they would ascribe to being uh, their own personal attributes as well. Isn't that right? Yes, you're absolutely right. I, I've uh, often said that if we vote for people that think the same way we do, we would have much more conservative leaders. Right. So tell me a little bit about the types of guests you have, and tell me a little bit about who's coming in the coming months. Yeah, we've been uh, honored to have some really terrific uh, speakers over the last few years. Uh, people like Victor Davis Hanson. We've had uh, Jesse Lee Peterson, Ward Connerly, uh, Star Parker. Um, 
Andrew Breitbart. John Lott, you know, Andrew Breitbart recently, John Lott. Uh, there's some really great speakers. Uh, in the next uh, few months, we've also got some real good speakers lined up. Um, we have uh, uh, Gary, um, sorry, Gary, I forget, <laughs> <laughs> from Hillsdale College is the next month, uh, Wolfram, uh, Dr. Gary Wolfram for next month. And after that, we have um, uh, Meckler, the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Mark Tea Party Meckler. Patriots. Uh, we, we have... Uh, uh, well, we have uh, Brian Sussman's coming. Yeah, Brian Sussman's coming up. We have uh, David uh, Horowitz is coming up. We have a lot of good people coming up this year, and that's one of the reasons that we're so popular as as a venue, is because people like to come there and listen to these type of people and some real powerful speakers. Okay, great. So tell me just a little bit in closing. We've got about a minute left. Tell us how to find out more information about the Conservative Forum. Okay, the Conservative Forum. First of all, we meet. Uh, every month, the first Tuesday of the month, except for uh, July. In July, we meet the second Tuesday of the month in order to allow room for celebrating the 4th of July, very important uh, holiday. Uh, we're at 432 Steerland Road. Uh, this is in Mountain View, the IFES uh, Portuguese Hall. Uh, you can find us uh, on the web uh, at uh, www.theconservativeforum.com. We start, at, oh, doors open at uh, 6.45, program starts at 7. And I think most people, like you say, without the labels, they come there and you listen, mingle with the people there, listen to the speakers, they'll find they have an awful lot in common with them. Well, we appreciate your sponsorship of the show and we appreciate your insight and we'll be looking to hear a lot more from you and the Conservative Forum in coming days. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. And so our last segment of the show is one where we like to have fun and we have no problem poking holes in people regardless of their political affiliation. But the next segment is one that will be focused on fraud, waste and abuse, which are definitely conservative types of topics. And we call this section, Spend It Like You Stole It. Now, this time in particular, in the Spend It Like You Stole It story, we're going to be covering a politician who actually stole it like they stole it. And that would be Mary Hayashi, the, uh, the assembly member from Hayward and Castro Valley, who just uh, in the last two days has been, her crime has been readjusted for her. She was accused of shoplifting over the last month and stole $2,500 worth of merchandise from Neiman Marcus. At the time, she'd claimed that a cell phone call had distracted her and she walked out with a pair of leather pants and some other accessories in her bag. Uh, the defense yesterday actually uh, used the plea that she has a benign brain tumor that caused some malfunctioning in her logic and her ability to make good decisions for herself. Uh, I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that her husband is also on the uh, the Alameda County judicial system or that she's connected in a lot of other ways but this temporary brain tumor got her off and had her reduced from a felony which would have required her to renounce her place on the assembly to a misdemeanor that uh, allows her to stay in place. Personally I think that she should have done a little different approach with her plea and said that as a member of the assembly they steal from the citizens and the businesses of California for a living, she got confused and thought she was still at work. But on that note, uh, we thank you this evening for your participation in The Right Side. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and we hope to have you back visiting with us sometime soon.